And with that, I'm going to introduce our new speaker. Uh, William, thank you very much for your patience. William Kennedy is a managing partner at Arden Labs in Miami, Florida, a mobile web and systems development company. He is also a co-author of the book Go in Action, the author of the blog Going Go Net, and a founding member of GoBridge, which is working to increase Go adoption through diversity. And the talk is called Go, Optimizing for Correctness. Let's put our hands together for William Kennedy. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I know you just got back from lunch, so you're gonna probably fall asleep in about 15 minutes. So I'm gonna run around and try to keep you guys on me. Now, I got about two parts to this talk. We only have an hour. I always feel like an hour is a long time. It really isn't. One, I wanna talk a little bit about what I mean by optimizing for correctness and show you how we can do that, at least in Go, because of the tooling that comes. And when I mean optimizing for correctness, I usually need a couple of days to actually explain that inside of a classroom. But I love quotes, and I love quotes from, from these people who have designed languages before, and I love this first one right here. I want you to look at that. There are two kinds of software projects. Those that fail <laughs> and those that turn into legacy horrors. I want to think about this. I want you as, you, as you're thinking about these quotes, what I want you to do is to reflect a little bit about yourself. What are your philosophies? What are your design philosophies? What are your philosophies when you're writing code? Integrity is very, very important as it relates to Go. It's one of our number one priorities. And these quotes are all around the priorities that you really should have, at least I believe you should have, when you're writing code. And this right here, your product's going to get into production. If it does, you're successful. But if you're unwilling, unable, if someone's afraid to change a line of code after it's in production, we've got a legacy. And how much legacy do we have in the world today? 40 years plus. I mean, right now when I hear about my bank wanting to make some changes, I'm like, stop. No. This is my money. I better start printing everything out, right? I mean, it's a scary situation. And I love this quote. I want the next movie to be not about asteroids and earthquakes, but about a piece of legacy software that's brought us all down. Because legacy software is an unappreciated but serious problem. It really is. And so I always love asking the questions, do you care about the legacy that you are leaving behind every day. Now, a big part here about correctness is mental models. I think this is huge. If you're not able to have and develop mental models around the software that you're writing, you are going to fail. That product is going to fail. Tom Love, who works on very large projects for the Department of Defense, had this quote. And he said, basically, in the United States, if you've got a project that's got over a million lines of code, that it's probably going to fail, well under 50% that it's going to be successful. Now, he loves numbers. And he did something one day. He identified that a ream of paper, you ever seen a ream of copy paper? That's about 10,000 lines of code can fit in a ream. A box, which holds 10 reams, is a hundred, you know, 10,000 lines of code. I could tell you right now, there is no way I could handle a mental model about more than a ream of paper. That's it. And I don't mean memorizing every line of code. It's, hey, where is this logic? Where is that logic? Where is this located? What does this do? Having that in your head. And I want you to think about how much code you can keep in your head. It's probably a ream of paper. And this is why he's starting to say projects fail. Because when you get to a million lines of code, you basically need 100 developers to be able to maintain that 100. I mean, we work on teams of probably four, three to four, five people. How hard is it just to manage a team of four people on a software project? We're I mean, talking about 40,000 lines of code there, right? And then we start getting to millions of lines of code. You just start doing the math. You just need a lot of people, and it becomes more of a people problem than a technical problem. And so in Go, we really focus on the ideas of writing less code, write less code. And here's some more really great quotes, all right, about, again, mental models. Mental models are so important. Brian Kernahan, the hardest bugs are when your mental model is just wrong. This is why one of the reasons I'm afraid of debuggers. I really am. I know there's value in them. I know that there is use. But a debugger can really hurt you because if you're leveraging the debugger to deal with all your problems, you're walking away from really validating your mental models where they're happening in code when you're getting logs and production issues. You can't always reach for that debugger. It's just going to be harder. And these are philosophies that we carry along with us when we're writing code in Go. I'm going to skip this stuff here, correctness over 
over performance. But again, some more quotes from, from, from people who have written programming languages over the last 40 years. This isn't coming from me. I want you to see that it's coming from them. Correctness of the implementation is the most important concern. Basic ideas are good, fundamental. I don't have to read these things. You can read them, right? These are things that if I believe you don't have right now in your head, I would want to ask you, what is the legacy you're leaving behind? And I think one of the powerful things about Go, it's, it's a small language, it allows us to write less code, it allows us to maintain um, mental models with much more feature and functionality around them. Okay, so I just wanted to throw those ideas at you um, because what happens is a lot of times is I'll walk into a room and I'll say, is performance a priority? And everybody will raise their hand. Is performance important? Performance is absolutely important, right? And a lot of people are going to go because they hear how, how fast these, uh, these apps that people are building are. It is important. I just don't want it to be the most important thing. And if you're writing code with performance in mind, then from my perspective, you're guessing and we don't want to guess. I want to show you some of the tooling we have here. So when you're writing code, you can think about what's the simplest way I can do this, what is the most readable way I can do this, and make engineering decisions around, do we want this extra level of complexity for maybe the few milliseconds we might be getting out of the code? And these are the trade-offs and the balances we have to make. We'll go through that exercise right now. But these are quotes from the last 40 years telling us day in and day out, write readable code, write simple code, performance will come. All right, so let's do the following. Let's start with this piece of code right here. Now, what this code does, I've tried to keep it uh, simple, something that you probably would be doing every single day. It's a find function. Now, what this find function is going to do, it's going to take some sort of topic string, and it's going to take a collection of XML documents that we're going to read and parse. I'm, I was afraid I didn't have a network, so we're just going to read a file. I'm going to pretend that I've got more than one of these files. It's going to be fine. But what we're going to do is go and range over these files. We're going to use the for range to range over these file names. There it is, a doc. We're going to open up a file. Then we're going to read that entire XML file in to memory. Then from there, we're going to decode it into a document that we can search for um, that topic name, both in the title and the description. So four stages of this program that have to do that. And right now, what we're doing is just uh, putting these documents together in that collection. I'm calling find on a single Go routine. So if you're at my talk yesterday, we talked about how Go routines and the scheduler works. So this is going to be a single threaded, single Go routine run. And what we're going to do is build this program and run it. And I'm going to use time to do that. So time trace. There it is. We found that, uh, that string 700 times, and it took 98 milliseconds to do that. OK, let's say that I should be able to do this faster. I really want to know, are we doing it? I mean, this is simple. If it's fast enough, as far as I'm concerned, we probably should be done here. And it's nice that we were able to do it on a single Go routine on a single thread. I have an eight core machine. but. Let's see if a profiler can tell us anything more about this program in a way that we could potentially speed it up. Now, since this is a program that we're writing, I can go ahead and use the pprof package from the standard library and tell the pprof package, let's start a CPU profile when this program's done. We'll call that stop. We'll defer that close there, and we'll, we'll create that profile. I'm going to write it to standard out also just to make it simpler for us. So let's go ahead now, I've saved this. Let's go ahead and we'll build it again. And this time we're going to run time again, trace that out, and I'm just going to write the profile to t.l. All right, so notice here how much time the profiler added to running this program, which makes sense because every 10 milliseconds this program has to basically stop. We've got to get those program counters and it's got to restart. All right, so I've got this profile. What can we do with it? Well, we can get some information about um, what code paths were the ones that are causing us the most pain here. And I can use the um, go tool pprof tool. And since I already have this um, trace now, I can say t dot out here. I'm now in the interactive profiler here. And I can use list uh, for the find function 
Now what we see now is a list of the code, the code that was run, how long each one took during the running of that program. And what I'm going to find here is that 40 milliseconds of it was opening the file, 30 milliseconds of that was unmarshal out of the total 80 milliseconds that we had in this, in this run. Hmm. This is nice to know, but it's really not helping me any because I still got to open up the file. There's no way to really fix that. And unless I find a different marshaller, I can't do much with that. So profiling is really good when we're looking for maybe heap related issues or maybe some hot paths that we can reduce. But in this particular case, it's not really helping me. What I need to see is not what's happening, but what's not happening. And this is where the tracer comes in. So why don't we run this program again, but this time what we'll do is we'll use the tracer instead of the profiler. So we're going to comment out profiling here, and I'm going to bring in the tracer. All right, well, we're going to run this program again. I'm going to bring this up a little bit. And we'll do that time, trace, and write t.out again. We'll notice that our performance came back even though we're doing tracing, which is really interesting to me because the tracer is going to be producing a tremendous amount of information. But we're probably not stopping the program every 10 milliseconds to get those program counters. All right, I've got a trace now. I want to see this trace. I can go back to go tool. This time I'll say trace t.out. And my browser will come up, and I'll have these options, and I'm going to choose the view trace option. All right, here it is. So this is a trace down to the nanosecond or microsecond, and microsecond, I think, of this program when it ran. At the top of this trace, what we're looking at is our heat. The green line here is the, the um, heat. Um, and this black line is going to be the live heat. So you, you could see here that we had a garbage collection right in this area here. The heat, live heat came down, it came back up. We had another garbage collection. So garbage collection is working. In fact, we've had one, two, three, four, five garbage collections during this whole run. I can actually come in and look a little deeper into that. But let's kind of go in here in the beginning for a second. We can see here that this go routine right here was the main go routine started on proc zero. We're running on that thread there. We can see where we were at the time that there was a context switch. We can see that we were on line 70 inside of find. I can come over here on line 70. This is where we were. We were processing unmarshal at that time. All right. I can see all of this. And I can dig in. These lines underneath are going to be system calls that we're making. I can also see here the number of threads or go routines that were in any of those given states. There's the one go routine that was running. It was executing on main. When we get to garbage collection, I probably see a few more. There it is. Got two running because the garbage collector is running on go routines as well. So I've got a tremendous amount of information here. We can even go deeper. But what's interesting here is our main function there, right? find, was running on proc 0 up until the last garbage collection, and then it jumped over to proc 1. But I think what this trace is really showing us is that I'm not leveraging every single core that I have on my machine. I'm leveraging two of them, but only one at a time. If we ran this, um, this code to be concurrent, to leverage, all of the procs that I have here, all of the logical processors, cores, threads, this should run faster. The question is how much more complexity are we adding to the software when we do this, and is it going to be a significant speed up to be worth the complexity? Well, there's only one way we're going to find out, and that's to do it. So let's change this find function to leverage go routines um, and what we'll do is we'll throw a go routine at every single document that we need to run across these four steps. So we can come into this uh, for range here and add a go routine. Come back down in here. That's not going to be enough yet, but let's get rid of these returns at this point because we're inside of a go routine. And that's going to create a go routine, but 
we're going to be in a lot of trouble if I just leave it like this. Um, using closures here isn't going to be really the best way to go about doing this. So let's pass in each one of these docs that every Go routine needs to be running with. There, that's going to be better. And so now we're going to pass in one of those docs. I'm still not done yet because even if I run it like this, as soon as main ends, this program's going to end and the scheduler's never going to have a chance to actually run a Go routine. I've got to wait for all of these Go routines, all 100, to finish. The best way to do that right now is to create a wait group. A wait group is a synchronous counting semaphore. And what it's going to do is allow us to wait for everything to get done. All right. Now, we're going to have length docs here, so why don't I just set us up for later here. Come on. And we can wait on, on that L. OK. So we're going to create a wait group. It's got add, done, and wait. What we're going to have now is we're going to add those 100. What we can do is tell every Go routine right before it terminates to report that they're done. Uh, we'll use wait group done. There it is. And now down here, what we can do is wait group wait. So this is going to help us now wait here, launch those 100 Go routines, wait before we return for all of them to come back. We do have one more issue, though. I don't like that. Um, we've got a, basically a data race here, right? I got 100 Go routines trying to plus plus on found at the same time. And I really don't want to make that global there either, because then we can have false sharing issues if this got larger. So why don't we do this? We'll create a, a local found. And we'll let each Go routine locally increment what they're, they're finding here. And then before they terminate, they can go ahead and add that to this found. Now, since we're going to be using the atomic instructions for this, I've got to be precise on that pre precision. And we have the atomic instructions here, uh, add int 32. I could take the address of found. And this is going to have to be that too. We can do this. That should now allow us to uh, do this. It would help if I spelled that right. And then I'm just going to have to do a, a quick conversion here back out. So we had seven, we found uh, 700 matches before when we were single Go routine. We're now going to be 100 Go routine. So let's make sure when we run this, at least we've got that same. Uh, 700, and we should hopefully see it faster before we were at about 98 milliseconds, right? All right, let's come back in here now. Um, we're going to do a go build. We're going to run this again, and let's see here. Time trace T out. There we are. We found it 700 times, and it looks like we're down to 47 milliseconds. So we cut that in half. I mean, that's pretty good, right? I mean, if we can get that kind of level of performance increase, I think we're going to want to take it. And I don't feel like the complexity of the code got too out of hand here at all. It's really still the same logic, just kind of thrown out there into 100 Go routines. So let's do the following. It'd be really interesting to see what the trace looks like. This was the trace when we were using a single Go routine. What does the trace look like? when we're going to be using, in this case, 100 Go routines. Kind of a prettier picture here, really, if you think about it. We're now leveraging every single core on my machine. Every one that's all being used, all of these Go routines were created, and they're running both in parallel and concurrently. It looks like we do have a little bit more uh, garbage collection, maybe another garbage collection run. The heap looks very much the same. We can see that a lot of Go routines are, are created there in the beginning. We would expect this because not every Go routine can run. So we've got 92 of them in a runnable state, eight of them running. That's pretty cool. But what's really interesting to me is this. When I look at this first garbage collection, what do I notice here? I notice that when this GC starts, this Go routine that was running on Proc0 is doing its decoding stuff like we saw before. But then the scheduler decided to run G84. G84 got context switched here, G8. And one thing I notice here is that malloc GC. That's the call to allocate memory on the heap. 
In fact, what's really interesting here is what's happening is while we're in this garbage collection, which is a concurrent garbage collector in Go, we're able to continue to run other Go routines that in this particular case are not causing any effects on the heat. <laughs> so we're getting all of this work done while the GC is running and doing its thing, and we're not slowed down at all. So throwing all these Go routines at the problem in this case actually was pretty efficient because the scheduler had opportunities all the way through this program to keep the work that we're trying to do moving forward. It's really some cool stuff. Now, every time I look at this profile, I always see this one big gap here. Remember when I told you we can see with a trace not just what's happening, but what's not happening? So we get this trace here on PROC3. We're not doing any work. Can't explain that. There's no documentation for this tool. So we're all kind of really learning how to use it and work with it as we go. All right, that's cool. So we just got a, a big increase in performance by throwing 100 Go routines and letting the scheduler worry about making sure that eight of them are running at any given time. But what I'm really curious about now is, do we get any extra performance increase if we don't put such a load on the scheduler? What if we decide that since I only got eight eight cores, only eight threads could technically run at the same time. What if I only threw eight Go routines at this problem? Only allowed eight Go routines to do the work. Will I get any extra speed up, a significant amount? This is definitely gonna be a little more complex in terms of the code. But if we can maybe cut that in half again, it might be worth the complexity. So why don't we try to do that and we'll see if we get any more um, performance improvements by doing that. So now what's going to happen is I'm going to want to just kind of limit us to the number of cores that, that I have here. And we've got a function here in the runtime package called um, runtime num CPU. I'm getting an error here because I declared a variable and I haven't used it yet, but we will. All right, now this becomes a little bit more complex because I only want eight Go routines doing the work. I'm not going to be having um, this situation here I only want really eight Go routines. Let's see, something like this, I less than that C number of, of cores that I have, I plus plus. That's all the Go routines that I want to create, but now I've got to be able to feed those Go routines the 100 documents that I want them to work on at the same time. So this is where a channel could really come in and help us. What we could do is use a channel. A channel is going to allow us to coordinate, orchestrate, coordinate Go routines in some sort of workflow. And that's exactly what I want to do here. I want to be able to um, pass all of those documents in. So let's say that we're going to create this channel of 100 buffers, one for every document. And what if we come in here and say, OK, let's range through these documents again. But this time, what we're going to do is we're going to load each one of these documents into the channel. And then I'm going to close this channel, because what's going to be nice here is once the channel is closed, we'll be able to flush that buffer out, and then it will signal that we've gotten through everything. So right in the beginning, on the main Go routine, we'll come in and load all of the work into this buffer channel up front, all 100 documents. Then we want to launch these Go routines here, but there's only eight. How are these Go routines going to get the work? This is where now we have to start receiving on this channel. Here we, we've pushed all the work into it. The next thing I'm going to want to do is receive on it. So I can use that for range again on the channel to do just that. So what this is now going to do is say, OK, let's range over each document. And if there's something to do work against, then we'll be able to do it here. I'm going to need, uh, where am I here? All right, we're going to need to range. So you're going to do that. We're going to do this step. We're going to do this step. We're going to do this step. And then we're going to be here. Probably want to do this too. Just keep it simple. There we go. And now I don't have to feed each Go routine the work. They're going to receive it on the channel. So that should be pretty good. 
Let's see what we got here so far. I know I'm missing something. So I got the NumCPU, I got length documents. I've got this weight group that we probably still need. I'm feeding the work to all eight Go routines right here by just loading this buffer up first. Now we're gonna create these eight Go routines. These eight Go routines are gonna range over this channel, basically receiving documents signaling to do work. They're gonna do step one, step two, step three. We're going to um, do the local. Probably could do this at the very end too, but let's just keep it here for now to keep things simple. We're gonna loop over there. At some point, there won't be any more documents in this channel. The for loop should terminate. Terminating the for loop should report that we're done. And this should all work exactly the same way. Hmm. Let's see if it works, actually. I've added a little more complexity to it. I could, could have a problem here, but let's see. So go build, time trace T out, and look at that. Isn't that fun here? Deadlock, I knew I was missing something here. This is the beautiful part about just coding here on the fly. Trace 111, 155. Let's see what I did here real quick. Say that again. Let's see here, I got a weight group here. I'm doing add. Oh, you're right. Thank you. So I gotta love that. That's what we have to do now, right? I always forget something. Yeah. All right, cool, All right. So I said the weight group should be 100 there. Reading needs to be eight, because how many go routines do we have now? Just eight, brilliant. I see we got some uh, great developers out there. So let's try this again. Go build. Let's see if we do it now. Perfect, thank you. But we only really shaved a couple of milliseconds off the time here by, by being trying to be more efficient with Go routines and added a lot more complexity to this program. Let's look at the trace for this one here. The trace seems to feel a lot cleaner compared to this one. There's a lot more going on. Every time we create a Go routine, we're gonna have a larger you know, those numbers. So it looks like this is a little more chaotic than what we're seeing here. But notice that the performance increase, I don't think was really worth the level of complexity that we added to this program. But again, the whole idea here is that we don't have to guess about performance at all. All we have to do is let the tooling tell us what's going on. All right. I want to show off a little bit more tooling here as well. Um, let's take a, a, a more real world program, maybe like a web service that's um, like a web application. Let's run it. Let's see how well we're doing in terms of performance. See if we can leverage the profiler to um, give us a, a good indication if there's improvements that we can make as well. Sounds good? All right. So let me just set that up here. Split the screen, that way we can move fast. I'm gonna add another tab so we can move fast. All right. All right. And let's go ahead and we'll build this program here called Project. We'll make sure that project first works. And I'm gonna do one more thing here, just so I can move faster as well. Just so I can copy and paste some stuff here. I'm gonna dive into some of this code, okay. Perfect. All right, so let's just run this program first. I think I have it running, local host now. What's gonna be interesting is this is going to have to leverage the network a little bit, and I'm on my phone. So let's see what happens here. But I'm gonna be competing with Google very, very quickly here. This is my new web application. It's gonna download some RSS feeds every 15 seconds, and um, we're gonna look for some stuff here. Now, if you really wanna make sure that you can find stuff here on this um, project, there's only uh, one person that you ever really need to search for. Now again, just to deal with time, I'm gonna do one more thing here as well. I'm gonna already set us up to get a garbage collection trace from this program. 
And I'm going to be able to do that by using the go debug variable, which the go runtime that's already built into project is going to respect. So we're running this again. Let me make sure that uh, this is good. And we're going to run a quick search for you know, our friend here. And if you want to find news, there's no other way around it. Now again, I'm on my phone tethering here, so we'll see, That's, that wasn't bad at all. There we go. All right, so we found some news on, on these RSS feeds. Here they are, and we've got them from all three. And when I did that, what we're gonna see here is um, a GC trace. All right, so in this GC trace, what are we seeing here? We're seeing that three GCs ran, this is going to be showing us our stop the world time. This and this is stop the world time. The garbage collector should never run for more than 100 microseconds anymore. We're seeing we're under that. This is the CPU clock. It's giving us very much the same information. This is time here that we're running concurrently. This is our heap, size of the heap uh, before GC, the size of the heap after, and the size of the live heap. That's kind of cool. Now, what I want to do now is run some load through this system, and I'm going to do that using my Hay tool here. Hay is a pretty nice tool for just generating load. So we're going to create 100 uh, concurrent connections to this server and 10,000 requests, and we're going to get a sense of how long that takes. So I'm now putting some load through my web application. You can see how much GC is going on. Um, that might be OK, it might be not. The garbage collector is really trying to maintain a small heap um, which is you know, our priority, and minimizing you know, how much time it has to run to keep that small heap. And what we're looking at is the pacing algorithm. So we've got about 31, 30, you know, there was a few GCs before that, but 31, 61 GCs um, ran, basically, and we're running at about 932 requests a second right here. All right, I do notice a couple of things here. The heap is very stable at about five or six meg, so I don't have any leaks in the heap. We are running at a one to two millisecond pace um, right now, but we're able to keep a very small heap, so I'm not necessarily upset with that. You just saw the scavenger run, which is gonna come in and try to give memory back to the OS if we need to. Okay, so I've got this profile. It doesn't look that bad. But I'm, let's, let's actually generate a profile and do a little more digging into terms of what's going on with memory. Now, one of the things I did already in this program was added an endpoint to give us the ability to look at the uh, profile information. And that's just adding a simple import. But I don't have a lot of time here. So I'm able to look at the number of go routines, and that heap link is going to be our heap profile, same one that we generated um, manually before. I have it on this endpoint. I was able to bind that through the use of the standard library. So what I'm going to do now is the following. I'm going to come in, and we're going to run this uh, search again. And when we do, um, what I'm going to do is uh, grab that heap profile very quickly, and then uh, we're going to look at the profile here. So I'm just going to copy and paste something here because we're running out of time. I'm going to be using that same go tool pprof command. I'm going to do it over here. And what this is doing is the same command I did before, but since I'm looking at memory, I want to tell it to look at alloc space. I want to see any allocation that occurred at any given time, whether it's still in the heap or not. And instead of giving it a file, I'm pointing it to that URL, which I'm able to extract that heap profile directly while this program is running. So we're going to put this load again through this um, application. There it is. Let it get cranking, 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 bop. All right, I just pulled a profile from a running Go program. And it's really recommended, as long as you don't expose that particular uh, endpoint, to put this in all of your Go programs. It's not going to cause you any pain until you actually hit the endpoint. Then it's going to be pulling. Worst thing is, is you, you expose that, and then you're giving a lot of information out. All right, I'm in the profile, but right now I'm looking for low-hanging fruit. So let me do a top command. Give me the top 40, sort by cumulative. And now what I'm going to see here is functions that are allocating the most. Cumulative means that allocations are happening from this function down the call stack. So it's not surprising to me that these functions are coming on top, because this is where requests start. 
but one thing that I'm looking for is code that I wrote. And if I keep looking for code that I wrote, eventually I'm going to find this right here. And that's the RSS search function. And this is a function that I control. And if you look in the cumulative column right here, you could see that I was allocating almost seven gig of memory from this function right here. So this top command has shown me some low hanging fruit. Why don't we look at RSS search and see what's happening inside that function. And when I do that, pretty quickly this comes up. There is my seven gigs of memory. It's coming from this line of code here. But I'm making two different calls. Is it contains or is it too lower? Again, I don't have to guess. I can get a call graph and filter that call graph right from this function here. Here we go. Now I know exactly what's happening. RSS search, which is that box at the top, is calling too lower, which is calling strings.map. So too lower is my pain point. If I could get rid of the too lower calls, I should be able to improve performance. Well, let's go back and look at the code very quickly. If I come and I look at this code, what I'm going to notice is all of you should take my programming card away. Look at what I'm doing. I'm in a loop calling too lower over and over and over again to do the description and the term. This is very, very, very silly code here. Every one of those two lower calls is definitely allocating memory on the heap. Now, remember, I've already been caching this stuff. Right above it, I maintain a cache. So technically, I should be able to do the following, and the code shouldn't change. I should be able to come in here and do the two lower for these items right out of the box here, dot description. And that should be strings dot two, two, if I do that right, two lower, taking the same thing. Now, if I do that here, then it will already be two lower in the cache. Look, I can get rid of this call, get rid of all those allocations. And it is silly to be doing this over and over and over again. Even here, I can just go like this. I can get rid of all of that. So let's do that. OK, I just fixed some code here based on what the profiler showed me. So very quickly now, let's come back in. Let's come here, hit Control-C. We do a go build very quickly. And we're going to run this project again. I want to make sure very quickly that it's still working here. App search, there it is, search. OK, we had some GCs there, so that's good. And let's put some load on this thing. We'll make sure it's working. OK. Now let's do that same 10,000. Remember, we were at about 950 requests a second or something with about 3,100 GCs. Look, this just finished. I only had to run the GC 1,500 times to do that same 10,000 request load. And we went from that 900 to 1,700. So we're definitely more than twice as fast, or about twice as fast now. Uh, some pretty cool stuff. Just by getting rid of some allocations. Again, I didn't have to guess about any of this. I want us, at the end, of the, the lesson that I want to bring here, at least, um, at least from a Go perspective, and I think it can carry on uh, to the other programming languages, is when we're focusing on writing code, I want to focus on on the average user on our teams. The average developer on our teams should be able to understand every single line of code that we're writing. And when we're hiring, we should understand who that average developer is. You put me on a crypto team, I am way down here, and I got a lot of work to come up. They can't dummy down that code for me. You put me on a business type of web API team, I've got to come back you know, this way and make sure that average developer, when I'm hiring somebody, I've got to be real honest about who they are. Um, and if we're doing that, then that code's going to be maintainable. If we're focusing on a lot of refactoring around mental models, that code's going to be maintainable. We're not going to be writing legacy code out of the box. And then we're going to leverage this tooling, once you have something working, to validate that the code we have is at least fast enough, for me, fast enough. And if it's not, then we don't have to guess about what we spend our time on, because wasting time is something that none of us really can afford to do. All right, thank you.
Would you be happy to take some questions? I'd prefer, if you have any Not questions, to. just find me in the <laughs> lobby or anywhere, and I'll sit down and talk to you. Okay, we've got plenty of time left, so uh, if you'd like to uh, ask William some questions, he prefers to do it privately. Uh, in the meantime, let's do it once again, and once again properly. William Kennedy. <laughs>